Whatever. Oh, I'm live? <laughs> okay, then. Anyway, my name is Paul Timmons. I'm doing the speech, How to Survive a Federal Investigation. Honestly, I wrote this outline in 2004, when I originally planned it speaking at Nauticon 1. Um, I was still under indictment, had not been formally arraigned at that point, so I wasn't able to be at Nauticon 1. Um, I was going to be at Nauticon 2, but I was sentenced two days prior and didn't even know who my PO was for two weeks after that. So, anyway, uh, I've got myself off probation, and so now <laughs> I can just come whenever I want. Finally, for the first time in three years, the government can't tell me what to do, at least in respect to those. <coughs> Um, anyway, uh, don't know how familiar people are with the case, so uh, basically I'll summarize it a bit. The uh, case was about uh, basically Adam Botbile and Adam Salcedo hacking into the Southfield Lowe's. And um, it started out that uh, I, Adam and I were arrested and they identified me as the passenger in the car who was doing all the hacking. I was described as a approximately six foot person with sideburns um, and a goatee and uh, of was a Latino descent. Um, they pulled me in, they arrested me on my way to the airport because I was on my way to uh, our headquarters at the company I work at who politely asked me not to say who they were. <laughs> um, anyway, so I was arrested. I was pulled out of a metro car, which if you're not familiar with what those are, it's Detroit has like these um, non-stretch limousines that you can order to take you from point A to point B. And apparently our company had a great deal with this that made it cheaper than just taking a taxi because I was like, hmm, I don't want to park my car at the airport. They're like, okay, we'll pick you up in a metro car. So it's heading down I-94, and six Southfield police officers box the car in and force it off the road. <laughs> and I'm just going, like, what? And the driver's like, who the hell are you? <laughs> I'm like, I was about to ask what you did. <laughs> and uh, the F then two unmarked cars just pull up alongside all the cars. All the cops get out. You know, they sit behind their doors guns drawn. Oh, no. And the two, cop, the two cars are just like Ford Tauruses. Dudes get out, they're in black clothing. They just walk up to my side of the car and knock on the window. <laughs> I'm like, oh no, oh no, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they're like, are you Paul Timmons? And I said, well, that depends on who's asking, really. <laughs> uh, and then they flipped open their badge, FBI, actually. Uh, and it looks nothing like Boulder and Scully's badge, for the record. <laughs> um, I looked at it, and I'm like, wow, that's really different. <laughs> They're like, yeah, it isn't like Muller and Scully's. I'm like, okay. So. <laughs> anyway, um, I get arrested, and, you know, they do the standard things like, um, you know, they, I get out of the car and they're all like got guns on me. Are you carrying anything? And you know, I'm like, no, I'm unarmed, really loud. And all the cops have to pull their guns down because now I've said if I'm, I'm, I'm not armed anymore. And so they can't paint me with their rifles until they prove otherwise. <laughs> I'm like, oh, cool. Now, now they're not <laughs> trying to shoot me. <laughs> um, you know, they seize everything. And um, at the same time, they're arresting Adam. Uh, he was working at a Office Max at the time, goes out for a smoke break. Uh, all of a sudden, a bunch of like U.S. Marshals pop out and arrest him right in front of the store. He's like sitting, smoking a cigarette, and U.S. Marshals. Guns drawn, like full flak jackets, U.S. Marshal logo. Like, U.S. Marshals, you're under arrest. So he's like, oh. <laughs> And, um, you know, at the same time, uh, Becky was at my apartment, at our apartment, uh, 
she gets a knock on the door. <laughs> and they're like, hey, you know, that FBI. Like, yeah, it was more like repeated thuds, probably. <laughs> um, and they serve a search warrant pulling they what I. Serve a warrant. I oh, yeah. Play games with them. Yeah, they were like, oh, yeah, we have a warrant. Oh, yeah, they show it to me. Yeah, she was actually pretty impressive. I have to give her mad props for that. Um, they kept trying to like convince her, oh yeah, we have a warrant, we don't need to show it to you. She's like, <laughs> yes you do. <laughs> and um, so they're like, oh, we'll have to wake up a judge. She's like, there's a duty judge, go get it. Um, and they come back with a search warrant and uh, then they see what actually is in my apartment and they go get a box truck. <laughs> um, actually, I have this up here the full list of everything they seized um, because, <laughs> oh yeah, these are all the court documents. If you ever want to collect a bunch of paper, get arrested. <laughs> oh, you'll see all of these, trust me. Close out at SD to save RAM. Um, anyway, uh, Last time I totaled the list, it was approximately somewhere between 20 and 40 machines walked out the door that day. It's All right, she totaled it. I didn't. Um, everything from blue telephone diagnostic tool, butt set, box with miscellaneous disks, numerous, box of miscellaneous documents. Um, the list was pretty exhaustive. They tried taking my cable box, Becky said. And the Dreamcast. Yeah, they're like, you can't take a Dreamcast. What the hell is he going to do with that? They did seize the Linux CD for it, though. <laughs> 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 um, my, my, one of my favorite things was they were marking some of my uh, multi-machine multi RAID computers as drive bays. They just looked at it and they said, well, this has six drives in it. It must just be a drive bay. I don't know. They're kind of stupid. But I'll get into that in a moment. Anyway. Um, I never used OpenOffice until uh, about 12 hours ago. So there's this little maze on the bottom here that was part of the template. I don't know how to get it off. And frankly, it, <laughs> screw it. It looks funny. Um, <laughs> Yeah, as it says, I'm not a lawyer yet, working on it. Uh, if you ever need to know this, for the love of God, go retain a lawyer. Anyway, what I found is pretty much no one in the government knows what's going on. Um, there, at any given time, you can go up to any court clerk, any FBI agent, even the ones handling the case that you're on do not completely know. You can be like, where are my computers at? And they're like, I don't know. Some other group has them. You're going, well, how do you not know? Isn't it your evidence? Well, you know, they have this and they have a bunch of procedures. But frankly, they don't know. Um, and there are admittedly few FBI agents who actually understand computer crime. You know, they all like, oh, yeah, well, I have Excel on my computer, so I'm, I'm a computer guy. And, um, their Unix expert had to call me f while I was being questioned, how, ask how to shut my computers down. Unix expert. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, you know, there's, why don't you unplug it? <laughs> but I instructed him actually, I'm like, no, log into this machine and then shut this down and do all this so it looked really obvious to everyone. I'm like, oh man, Paul's whole apartment just dropped off the internet. Six people dropped off IRC. Now I can't reach his mail server. What's going on? <laughs> so I took the opportunity to kind of send a message something really bad was happening. <laughs> I actually convinced him to um, shut down one of my machines with the argument of OMG as the <laughs> argument to shut down. <laughs> So everybody gets a wall message, system going down now, OMG. <laughs> um, basically, in summary, it's the intention of the US attorney that you never see your day in court. The, the deck is stacked against you the minute you're arraigned. 
Um, they don't really have the resources to properly prosecute you. And apparently, in the in the entire state of North Carolina, the um, FBI has, according to their agents there, uh, one computer forensics expert. So um, they seized probably about 115 disks because each one of those servers, each one of those computers had RAID. So um, do forensics on that one dude and mix it in with all the kiddie porn criminals and everyone else, the mafia bosses. And uh, they still have not to this day actually ran any forensics on my computers. They seized them in November of 2003. Um, the government uh, is kind of lazy, doesn't really pay attention to detail. Um, they actually issued the first warrant for importation, possession with in intent to distribute an importation of cocaine. <laughs> the US section codes down there, 2371, 1029, and 1343, are conspiracy, mail fraud, um, improper use of access devices, computer intrusion, and another form of mail fraud. So um, they, they weren't even looking. It's actually a word template that they fill out in order to print an arrest warrant. And they spelled my name wrong. You'd think that after spending countless resources and having an actual office staffed, they had a field office staffed on a Sunday night to arrest me and question me. They still didn't spell my name right on the arrest warrant. Um, the first thing they do is they arraign you. And uh, then they tell you, oh yeah, you're going to have a preliminary hearing in a few days. Well, that's never really the truth. Uh, what happens is, is that they, you as a US citizen are entitled to one of the two, a um, preliminary hearing or an indictment. And in a preliminary hearing, you can actually fight the evidence. You can see what their arguments are. In a grand jury, it's secret. You don't even get to know you're being indicted. You don't get a chance to fight it when it happens. Your attorney doesn't know. He can't be there. You don't get to know what they showed the jury to convince them. They could have, you know, doctored pictures of you, you know, molesting a llama, for all you know, and indict you for, you know, kitty porn. Doesn't matter. Once you're indicted, you don't get a preliminary hearing, and the next time you have a chance to fight it is in trial. So you are doomed. Um, and plea bargains. Uh, this is something you'll see a lot in federal court. Often and you'll see that actually anyone taking a federal case to trial is very rare. And it's because I pled on a plea bargain. I was arrested in 2003 and sentenced in April of 2005. I, went, I moved and went through two cars in the time it took for me to plead guilty. If I had gone to trial, it would have taken an additional three years, according to my attorney, during which time I would have still been on bond. I would still be awaiting trial right now. Um, plea bargains end up being not only that, but um, in many cases, employers, you'll find, have this thing where if you're arraigned on a felony, you get put on unpaid administrative leave. Try paying for an attorney when that happens. Innocent until proven guilty uh, only applies to the US government. Your employer can still decide, well, you're, we're in at will state. Screw you. Get out of here. <laughs> um, so pretty much when you get arrested, you're, you're pretty much stuck with a plea bargain unless you're already going to go and get, you know, your plea bargain is for actually what you're going for. So you know, if they're giving you 70 years and your plea bargain's for 70 years, you might as well go to trial. But Otherwise, everyone takes the plea bargain. Um, it works out well for the government because they don't actually have to gather evidence or do any work. They can simply say, well, you know, remember that 16 count felony indictment? Here's a single misdemeanor. Would you like to sign that? After three years, it sounds like a bargain. And uh, another thing is, there is such a thing as a federal misdemeanor. You have no idea how many people do not know this people who should know. As it says, um, I tried to pay my fine at the court. 
the cashier wouldn't ring it up. She said I was lying. It's like, you can't, this is a mis, there's no such thing as a misdemeanor. This fine is wrong. I'll call the judge. I'm like, go for it. <laughs> she called the judge and I showed her the paperwork. She's like, oh my God, you're right. She called all of her coworkers over to look at my paperwork. Y'all gotta come look at this. And this is North Carolina, so it really was. Y'all gotta come look at this. <laughs> um, she then had to call help desk to figure out how to ring up a misdemeanor fine because she had a felony button. Apparently it was something like shift felony or something, I don't know. <laughs> but she was on the phone with help desk for a good 20 minutes trying to ring up a $100 fine. <laughs> um, the last, the, the four words you never want to see after your name, the grand jury charges. That's probably the most uh, soul crushing thing you'll ever see. The entire United States of America versus three people. Who do you think's going to win? <laughs> anyway, the, the, the way that a search warrant is typically executed is, uh, you know, the search warrant was so template, they were talking about punch tape paper, they were talking about nine track tapes. They were like, yeah, you, you can take optical, magnetic, paper based. You know, they're, they're looking for paper tape punch readers. They don't know. So what they do is they grab anything plugged into the wall. They tried to take my cable box and my Dreamcast. Becky got pissed off and said, there's no way in hell you're leaving with a cable box. That's a freaking cable box. That can't be evidence. They did take my Dreamcast games, an AIX machine without a hard disk, a 386 in several pieces, random motherboards, and a homebrew 48 volt power supply that was a transformer in some sort of enclosure. If I recall right, it was a coffee can full of sand. Um, I wouldn't touch it. They seized it. As I put, my God is a vengeful God. <laughs> the little lightning bolt killing them dead. Um, it didn't actually happen, but I'm honestly shocked. Um, as the next slide is titled, hey, they're talking about you in NPR. You see, they took anything I had to consume media other than the television set. Um, I had no idea. So I get calls from friends like, hey, man, uh, I just heard this thing. Are you that guy that they're talking about? Yes, that's me. They're like, holy shit, dude, you got arrested. I'm like, Yes, I did. <laughs> um, you find yourself mentioned in all kinds of wacky articles as like a side reference. Um, this one was from Business Week, and that one was from the Free Press, where they were talking about like some dudes trying to sell some snake oil solution for uh, securing wireless networks, and they referenced my case um, being used to sell this product now. Um, and uh, at the time, according to my friends, uh, searching for my name on Google News was turning up stuff in freaking Chechnya. Just like two dudes in a like modem somewhere, and you know, there's like goats walking by, and they got a website, and they're talking about me. And uh, that's some freaky shit. Here's the, all the places I was mentioned. Uh, every morning drive show in Detroit. NPR, the 6 p.m. audition of Fox 2 News, uh, the opening shot was of the Lowe's. And I didn't need to see any more before I realized this show, this, is, this one's about me. <laughs> um, we were featured in page one of the Oakland section of the Free Press, which is actually the second part of the Free Press, um, in larger print than Teen Killers Sentenced. <laughs> Two hackers from Waterford broke into Lowe's. Um, and uh, the funny part about this is I, I got up late because, well, they seized my alarm clock. <laughs> <laughs> and so I tried to play it cool. I go into the office on Tuesday, just like nothing happened. Like, hey guys, what's up? They're all like gathering around the newspaper. They're like, what? Is this about you? You live in Waterford, right? I'm like, what? What do you mean? <laughs> How do you know about that? 
like, well, I heard it on the drives in, so I picked up a copy of the free press and you're in there too. Terrific. And uh, my boss was there from California. Uh, I guess he noticed I didn't make the plane. <laughs> and uh, so I, I was forced to take uh, six weeks of vacation time that I had banked up to uh, mount a legal defense. Needless to say, eventually they figured out, okay, there can't, and I should show the indictment, I'll do it afterwards, but there are obvious sections where it's like, this guy was a driver, and there was an unidentified suspect in the passenger seat, um, you know, hacking at 9.43 on, you know, September 30th or whatever. And... They were like, so we're going to charge these three people. You do the math. There's two people in the car. How can three people be charged for this crime? It's easier. Apparently, the grand jury doesn't even read what they're about to sign, because there is no counter defense to a grand jury. The, uh, the prosecutor walks in. They said, hey, guys, um, I know you're a standing grand jury, and you've seen about 20 cases today. How's one more? Um, Here's these guys, they're really bad, they steal credit card numbers, uh, y'all want to sign this. That's a lot of pages. Sounds good to me. And uh, then, you're, then you're charged. Uh, you don't get to fight that. You don't even get to find out what they deliberated on, what was going on, what the prosecutor said about you, anything. It's simply, all you get is this indictment, and you're actually not even notified it happened. I found out because somebody looked it up on the internet and they're like, hey, dude, you got indicted. And I'm like, really? <laughs> I was wondering if they would do that. <laughs> so that's, that's the reality of things. They're so, um, they're so disorganized, I never actually received a copy of my own indictment in the mail. Now there's something for you. Um, I was released from probation just after Thanksgiving of 2005. I have no gun restrictions, res any restrictions of any sort. I have a Class A misdemeanor on my record. Um, you'd be surprised how many systems run under the assumption that any federal crime is a felony. The National Instant Criminal Check System used for firearm checks can return one of three responses. Proceed, decline, or deny. Or proceed, deny, or delay. And I've been run through it twice, trying to buy firearms. Each time, they return a delay, which after 72 hours, it's no longer relevant. Um, they figure that the, the FFL is then allowed to just give you the gun if they don't reply. Um, Dunham's has a corporate policy not to. I made the mistake of going there first. Um, obviously, the second time I was successful. <laughs> um, you're also pretty much, your criminal record appears in the MDT when you get pulled over for pretty much anything. You know, like, hey, you got a broken headlight. So you're a computer hacker, huh? <laughs> Did I hack my headlight? <laughs> yeah, you know, they're like, oh, well, did you break into a computer? Well, yes, I did. Um, technically, what I, what I pled to was using Lowe's network in March of 2003 to check my email. Uh, the store was under construction then, and I did, in fact, connect to Lowe's and check my email with their stuff. It was all in default configs at that point. It was connected to their corporate WAN, and uh, their DNS servers are open for zone transfers from pretty much anywhere. And... Uh, I would tell you about the back doors that they installed on their own systems, but uh, frankly, I think they're still there. And so out of uh, courtesy, I'm not going to, but uh, NMAP will show you. It's bad. Don't shop there, for the love of God. <laughs> the actual response as to why they didn't deploy WEP or MAC address security properly on their access points is WEP is insecure. <laughs> mm-hmm, sure is. Uh, as I say, at least when I die, I'll be remembered for something. Uh, pretty much typing my name into Google 
will return hits on this for at least three pages. And um, there's a lot of in incorrect information out there based on people who haven't actually followed the case but decided they have an opinion on it anyway. Um, there are still plenty of websites that are completely under the idea that uh, Brian Salcedo didn't exist and uh, it was simply me and Adam. And uh, frankly, as I had told the FBI, look, if I hacked it, we wouldn't have gotten caught. <laughs> Case in point, I actually had to tell them about the intrusion on the misdemeanor charge. They didn't know it ever happened. But they were like, you come up with something you did, and you, you, you can plead to that. And so, uh, <laughs> Fifth Amendment what? <laughs> um, so yeah, that basically there's still things on the internet. People will look at that and think it's actually the truth. And that's where the problem lies is there are a lot of irresponsible people out there who don't realize that their words have permanent effect on the internet. They're being archived, they're being searchable, and um, it would be slander, but they're idiots, so it doesn't, it's, they're not, it's not malicious. Um, but uh, I'm gonna show you a couple of things uh, just because I think you as an audience will get uh, quite a kick out of them and I have a hell of a lot of time. After that, I'll take some questions. I'm sure there's plenty. Um, oh, I do like this one very so much. Uh, my attorney, I actually had to find my own arrest warrant. Uh, I logged into Pacer and looked it up. And I sent it to my attorney who went, oh my God, are you serious? So he wrote a letter to the US attorney. <laughs> I realize you're not in the drug unit, but Paul Timmons came across information that he and his co-defendants were the subject of arrest warrants for importation of cocaine. <laughs> Obviously, there's been some mistake because the Paul Timmons who is named in the arrest warrant is spelled T-I-M-M-O-N-S rather than T-I-M-M-I-N-S. We've determined the warrant was not executed, but we can't find if there is an order re recalling it. Uh, funny story about that. I got pulled over for following too closely, uh, going through uh, was it West Bloomfield on Telegraph. A uh, cop pulls me over, runs my plates. Um, you know, I notice he's not approaching my car. I can't figure out why. Two more officers in squad cars show up, and they come over the speaker, take your keys out of the ignition and put them on the roof of your car. I'm going, what? <laughs> What did I do now? <laughs> um, so they come up and they're like, hey, you know, uh, you're Paul Timmons, right? Yeah, here's my driver's license and all this other stuff. They're like, cool, step out of the car. <laughs> do you have anything sharp on you? And I'm like, well, yeah, you know, I typically carry all these, like, um, I carry wire cutters. I do. Uh, so they took those away from me. They're like, mm, why is this dude carrying wire cutters? Uh, God forbid I had ever do any wiring. Uh, and they were like, okay, so um, do you have any reason why we're arresting you right now? Like, well, let me guess. There's probably a warrant in there saying that I broke into something on a computer. And they're like, actually, there is for computer intrusion. Like, funny that, I was arrested for that about a year and a half ago. And they're like, really? <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, it happened in Southfield. They're like, oh, <laughs> well, uh, here, cuff yourself, and uh, we'll put you in the back of the car while we figure this out. And so here's where I actually got to find out the MDT say this sort of thing. He puts me in the back of the car, and... Um, I actually convince him to show me how the MDT works <laughs> while he's waiting. <laughs> and he's all like, yeah, no, it's cool. You can type in your name. And he types in my name and in gigantic red letters. Um, officer, warranting, officer warning, wanted felon, FBI. <laughs> and then it shows my mug shot. Oh, no. And I'm like, <laughs> OK, now I understand. So they call up the FBI agent who says something to the effect of, 
for the love of God, let him go. We do not need a false arrest charge. Um, because, as you can tell, their case was pretty tenuous to begin with. And uh, if they actually did full carry forth with that, they probably could, I probably could have gotten the case thrown out. Just repeated incompetence. <sighs> anyway, uh, he did invent eventually let me go. Uh, the best part was the dispatcher actually relayed the message verbatim, for the love of God, let him go. <laughs> He's been arrested before our bad. <laughs> Which he laughed his ass off. He's like, man, that's the funniest thing I've heard on the radio all week. <laughs> so um, I never got the ticket. I actually got off the ticket. Um... <laughs> Yeah, following too closely it knocked up my insurance a bit, so I'm kind of happy. Anyway, here's what an indictment looks like. Should hope that none of your names ever appear on one. Um, it contains a lot of what I refer to as the blah, blah, blah. Um, telling a story. The story isn't necessarily accurate, it's whatever the prosecutors think. So, um, you'll see. You know, apparently at 2 p.m. on October 26, 2003, me, Adam, and uh, Salcedo hacked into a store in Kansas. Um, most of these allegations were never justified or proved. But um, apparently I get around hacking things all over the place in South Dakota. All right. Um, the most terrifying thing about everything is that they they do all their bank approval and credit card transactions over their own internal network, which uh, is strapped to their voice over IP handsets, which have these interesting little um, base stations, which uh, are just sort of Cisco access points. Um, they actually never intended to deploy a wireless network. They were the base stations for their phones. They never looked. Um, so yeah, we were a phone. So they're transmitting credit card transactions across their network. Um, all of their machines have a custom written, what amounts to a backdoor. It's for administrative purposes for Lowe's internal staff, but uh, it's not encrypted. There are no passwords. Connect to it with netcat type space, bin bash, enter, and uh, your root. On their cash registers. And this works for any of their cash registers nationwide. And they're all interconnected. They can reach each other. They're all running Red Hat 7.2, by the way. <laughs> so don't shop there. Yeah, in effect, don't shop there. Well, you can use cash. <laughs> uh, ironically enough, the first time I ever stepped into a Lowe's was at, well, I was on probation. I had never actually seen the inside of one. I had to check it out. <laughs> I decided, well, you know, while I haven't been sentenced yet, I'm not going in one just in case they go, well, you know, this dude's coming back to the scene, blah, 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 blah. No. Um, <coughs> I waited till afterwards, and I go there and there, and I'm like, oh, I think I'll get a punch down block. And they're more expensive. And I'm like, eh, I can't see any good reason to shop here, <laughs> to be perfectly honest with you. Um, not to mention the amount of lawyer fees uh, I've paid just to defend myself from this. Uh, I'll never recoup that in the amount of savings I'll get over Home Depot. <laughs> they don't have discounts for stuff like what you did? <laughs> you would think they do, but actually they just kind of would rather I didn't shop there, uh, surprisingly. <laughs> I can't see why. Um, so I was actually charged with 16 felony counts uh, with a pos total possibility of something like 90 years in federal prison. And um, from what I've been told by Botbow, there is no real ass pounding in federal prison. I guess it all depends on whether you go to the camp like he did or, you know, some kind of like uh, camp clink or something where you're just locked up with a bunch of violent felons. Um, he was telling me that his actual prison uniform was a uh, polo shirt and a pair of khakis. 
half of you are probably wearing his prison uniform right now. <laughs> um, the actual uh, borders for the place, it just had doors. They weren't locked. You could, if you felt so inclined, you could walk out the door and cross over the line that says, past this line you have escaped. <laughs> and walk right into the city. That's considered what they call a walk-off. In a prison camp, they don't call it an escape. It is, however, treated like an escape, and you'll find your ass in Alcatraz for that sort of thing. So they, you typically won't do that sort of thing. And they notice you're gone after you miss three roll calls. And you order pizza. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if someone's ever ordered pizza from there. Um, and just as another example of how disorganized the federal government is, uh, while in prison, Adam was permitted to communicate with me and use computers because he, was, he, he pled to um, federal conspiracy charges. That's it. He's not a computer criminal. I'm the hacker. <laughs> anyway. Um, so he was writing me letters in Microsoft Word. He was like, yeah, I wrote this crazy chat program that uses SQL and access out of boredom. I was impressed. Uh, he sent me a program listing. Uh, and so now he's in a halfway house. He just got there a couple of weeks ago. And um, they're like, oh, you're a computer criminal? You can't use computers. And uh, you can't talk to this guy as your co-defendant. And he's like, um, uh, actually, he was dismissed from this whole case, and they charged him under a different case. So he's not my co-defendant. And uh, guys, you let me use computers in prison. What do you mean I can't use them in a halfway house? Well, this paperwork is different. And his probation officer, who's already been assigned, said, I have no problems with him using a computer or talking to Paul. Um, frankly, I don't think he's a risk at all. But he doesn't technically have jurisdiction over him until September. So um, what he says doesn't matter. Um, the Bureau of Prisons is still trying to figure out what actually happened with that case. They don't know. I suggested they just log into PACER and pay the 60 cents, but <laughs> me being the voice of reason, <laughs> that's a scary thought. Um, and oh yeah, do they, does it ever look terrifying? Um, of note to some of these, uh, I misplaced the paper that actually where I went down count by count and showed how I couldn't have been there. Uh, a couple of times I was at a storage unit where they actually logged my entry and exit. I'm like, okay, well, how can I be in Madison Heights and Southfield at the same time? Well, I don't know. Um, another time, the camera they seized has pictures of me with timestamps and an actual receipt that I had making a purchase uh, was it something like 60 or 70 miles north of the Detroit metropolitan area during three of the intrusions because I was out trying to see stars where there were no street lights. I stopped at a gas station and bought some stuff on my credit card. There's cell phone records too because you had to call me to um, pick one of your servers. Yes, there is. <laughs> Not good enough for them. Because they were like, oh, take it to trial. I'm like, there's not going to be any trial. Come on. Um, the, also, the most amusing one was when I was actually in the county EOC receiving an award for helping out at a police open house. <laughs> I was doing so in front of police officers and an FBI agent. They said I was hacking Lowe's at the time. <laughs> Even after they saw the minutes of the meeting. Um, wow, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, I'm crazy. So what would you do differently? What would I do differently? Um, well, I've instituted a no roommates policy. Uh, because the previous ones I had before this um, decided that uh, heroin was a good idea and uh, began to break into my room and steal my stuff and uh, sell it to you know, heroin and crack dealers. Um, there are plenty of interesting stories about them, but I'm like, oh, this Adam guy, he's a good friend of mine. He's, I've known him since high school. He's got to be more level-headed. 
Um, in retrospect, I probably would have gotten in less trouble with the other guys. Um, and they, they took less computers. Uh, the other thing I would have done differently, uh, when I was initially questioned, I tried the Hannibal Lecter thing while being questioned. Like, oh, I'm not going to talk to you unless you tell me information first. Because they didn't even tell me why I was being arrested. They're like, you're being arrested on computer intrusion charges. And I'm sitting here going like, which ones, which ones? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, then I, initi I eventually got out of them after, you know, are you Paul Timmons? Yes. Who, why am I being arrested? Well, computer intrusion, we told you that. No, 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 not good enough. You know, what did I break into? that you allege I break into. And they're like, oh, well, Lowe's. I just start laughing. I'm like, ha, 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 finally the one I didn't do. <laughs> <laughs> and um, evidently, they thought I was kind of cocky. Um, I made quite a few enemies at the FBI by questioning their intelligence. Uh, they said I was particularly eloquent in my um, vocabulary. And I said, well, the amusing part is, uh, you're the four-year college graduate, and I'm not. <laughs> what does that say? Because uh, their vocabulary is rather simplistic. And um, they didn't like that much. <laughs> um, but I did get them to buy me a cheeseburger um, and a whole bunch of other things. In reality, I should have called a lawyer. <laughs> um, but I was basically holding the lawyer over their heads to get information because I figured, well, <laughs> obviously I'm innocent. Um, <laughs> worked out well. Uh, basically, if I had brought an attorney on at that point, I'm, this might not have ever happened. On the other hand, I would have had to pay to get into Nauticon, so. <laughs> That's true. It's a great conference, by the way. Uh, I got 100% less crap stolen than at RubyCon. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, yeah. There's Brian. Uh, this is all you'll probably see of him for the next nine years. That's his mugshot. Uh, he actually got nine years in federal prison for uh, stealing six credit card numbers. Ultimately, his programs weren't successful. The rumor is he was kind of high while he was writing the programs. They noticed because the cash register stopped working. Um, th what I've heard is, is that the actual way that they caught it was not because there was any you know, actual logging or IDS or anything. Um, a vendor logged into an inventory system and uh, got some funny character instead of a menu. That character was a pound sign. So he called the help desk. He's like, man, I logged in as a vendor vendor. That's their actual username and password for that account. And um, <laughs> they, he's like, I'm not getting my menu. They're like, what are you seeing on the screen? Uh, well, there's this uh, pound sign. And they're like, <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> So they actually started looking and immediately called the FBI, like, uh, guys, I think we've been hacked. Something's going on. Um, the FBI has still not returned my belongings. Um, depending on who you ask, they don't know who the, where they are, or they haven't been properly inventoried, or any number of reasons. I get a different excuse every day as to why or what the disposition of my gear is. Uh, legally, I'm entitled to having it back. Um, there's actually a constitutional amendment about that. But um, realistically, I don't think it's going to be any time this millennium. So I just went out and bought better computers anyway. They, they were kind of slow. Uh, if you're watching, I still want them back. I lost a lot of data. Pisses me off. Um, as far as data backup, um, I found if you have anything that you really care about, uh, the, the old uh, adage that it doesn't exist unless it exists in two places uh, needs a corollary of um, it doesn't exist unless it exists in one place you control and one place you do not. 
because had I brought a burned DVD to my office, I would have had a copy of everything. If I had burned, given a DVD to a friend, I would have had a copy of everything. Um, when I got out, I went and purchased a hosting at a company in Canada. Like, hey, this ain't the US, sees this. Um, and I used that to store things like my uh, PGP keys and various things I needed to recover just in case they decided to raid me again. Um, currently, I have this elaborate system developed that, uh, where I insert a file into a database and it goes into this mesh of computers that distributes it around the, a couple of computers all over the United States and uh, has no method of deletion. So, and if you delete it from one node, it just re-replicates. <laughs> You're always free to connect to port 710 and or uh, 7100 and find out. Um, uh, let's see, this other comic is pretty funny too. It tells the whole story of my indictment and cute little dinosaurs. Um, and really, you gotta love that. Uh, come on. Oh, and uh, does anyone have any questions? Aside from the cost of the gear, what kind of dollar amount would you put? You mentioned, you know, cost wise, that you'll never recruit. What kind of, how much money are we talking about? Exactly? Um, the entire experience, aside from the cost of the gear. Well, federal government, uh, to convince a lawyer, to represent you in a federal case and fly all over the country with you as they indict you in various places because it wasn't as simple as, oh, you live in Detroit, let's go there. It's, we'll arrest you in Detroit, drop that case, and immediately re-indict you in North Carolina and uh, have fun going to North Carolina every time there's some little piddly hearing. I actually had to go to North Carolina where they said, are you the same Paul Timmons that's on this indictment, lives at 235 East Lincoln Avenue? Yes. Okay. That's called an identity hearing. And uh, that cost me about 60 bucks in gas and a hotel stay. Just to say, yeah, I'm Paul Timmons. Ain't that special. Um, total amount I've paid on retainer is about $30,000. Uh, I don't have a full accounting as to how he spent it, um, but I'm not counting on getting any of it back because We've taken planes. We've spent, you know, three-day trips in North Carolina where I, we all had to take time off work. And he had to, like, set aside other cases because they would screw with the schedule. We'd land on the plane. He'd have a voicemail like, oh, well, we moved your thing till tomorrow. Oh, really? That would have been good to know two days ago. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, well, I, I got a couple of questions. One is, um, where does all this money come from? I mean, I took wouldn't have 30 grand sitting around for the entire world. Um, at the time, my parents had taken out a home equity loan. Uh, <laughs> I owe them a lot of money. <laughs> and um, why, why not get a, uh, a public defender? Um, oh, interesting story about my public defender. The first time I met him, he left a message on my answering machine. You'll be so pleased I negotiated a felony plea bargain. <laughs> you did, huh? Yeah, you'll get no time in jail. I said, ain't that special. You've never even talked to me. Do you even know what I'm being charged with? <laughs> Looks like computer intrusion. Oh, ain't that terrific. And that's what a public defender's money buys you. Without consultation, he had already negotiated a plea agreement for a felony without even talking to me. So um, I said, you know, I gotta be able to pay better than this. Um, so that's why I didn't have a public defender. And that was in which district? Uh, the Eastern District of Michigan. But um, from what I hear, it's pretty universal. Uh, they're used to pleading people out and they're used to everybody that is being arrested being guilty. We're probably gonna need to end questions there. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for being, listening. I hope it was good.
Real quick announcement. Um, Jason Scott was kind enough to throw us many hundreds of dollars to get free pizza for everybody down here at 2 o'clock. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're going to feed you today. Actually, I'm not going to feed you. Jason's going to feed you. And also, we're going to be getting some more stuff for the cons. I'm spading.